Did you? Yeah, over two years. The same job or just different roles the, within? So it was, I would just say three different types of roles, similar, okay. but those for the, yeah. For, 33 times? 33 times. Wait, we need to go into this. Go on. You applied 33 times? Yeah. How many times did you, like, interview? Hi guys, welcome to another episode of What My Best Friend Does, where we talk about what your best friends do so you don't have to. Today, I'm joined by my best friend, the talent manager, Sam. How you doing, bro? I'm good, thank you. Welcome to the show. Thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, no, we like to start with a little icebreaker. Okay. What did you want to be growing up? I wanted to be a footballer. Oh. I think like everyone, yeah, <laughs> I, I, you probably get everyone saying the same, but I wanted to be a footballer. It's my favourite sport from the beginning. I wanted to be like Henri. You know, oh, I'm an Arsenal titty. fan. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Arsenal fan. Um, that was my biggest thing growing up, wanting to be a footballer, but obviously it wasn't that good enough, isn't it? I was like, was it, it wasn't injury, like, like most people. <laughs> it wasn't injury, just, just, it just, I was not that good enough. The, 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 the blessing wasn't there in nah, the feet. Nah, it wasn't. Nah, <laughs> nah, it wasn't. So, nah yeah. I'm, I'm playing with you. So um, you wanted to be a footballer, um, you found your way into talent management. Talk us through um, your journey and the various roles that you've had up to this point. Yeah, so day to day, I'm actually... A banker. A banker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jeez. So I work in I work in um, private banking. Um, I've been in um, private banking for about five years now. Okay. But if you want to dial it back, so when I came out of university, I wanted to get into marketing. So what I, did you do at uni? So I studied business study, it's business administration okay. in university, and my favorite course on that was marketing. Okay. Um, tried to apply for so many jobs outside of uni, probably. I would say three months after uni, but I couldn't get any marketing jobs. Really? Yeah, super, super hard. And the type of marketing that I wanted to get into was campaign management, because I found it very interesting of like creating an idea and then kind of it being released and then seeing like the, the Result. ending results and stuff like that. So that's the type of marketing I wanted to get to, but I didn't. Um, so my best friend at the time, he was working as a cashier in HSBC. Okay. And I was like, look, I need some money. Um, why not? Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, I'm, yeah. Cool. I'm cool with talking to people. Um, banking seems interesting. Um, so I basically, yeah, applied for a at HSBC and then me and him worked together. So that's how I kind of started my career. Yeah. I was there for a couple of years, then moved to NatWest. Um, so I was there for about, I want to say three years. Um, and in that, in that role, um, I got exposed to affluent types of clients mm. um so i was working in canary wolf at the time um and i found it just so fascinating about how people like kind of made their wealth and like these like really big jobs and and stuff like that um and that kind of opened me up to the whole private banking um sector essentially um and at, at the time that i was working there um to get into private banking I made good connections with people that I met um, that came into the branch network and understood what I kind of needed to do to get there. Mm -hmm. So a really important thing was um, exams um, to be able to give like um, investment advice essentially. Mm -hmm. So I was really proactive in doing those exams whilst I was still in the kind of branch network mm -hmm. to kind of put myself um, like to separate myself from kind of the pack, essentially. Did um, did they fund it or did it cost money, first of all? No, it cost money. So <clears throat> because it's not something that was um, done regularly within the branch network, I had to pay for it myself. Wow. Yeah, I had to pay for it for myself. But it was a good investment, to be fair. There's no bigger investment than in than, yourself. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, so I did pay for it myself. Passed a few of their exams while I was there. Um, and there was a specific bank that I wanted to work at, which I felt was the creme de la creme um, of it. And I applied for that role at that bank for, I want to say, about 33 times. Did you? Yeah, over two years. The same job or just different roles within? So it was, 
I would say three different types of roles, similar, okay. but those for the yeah for thirty three times. Thirty three times. Wait, we need to go into this. Go on. You applied thirty three times. Yeah. How many times did you like interview? Twice. Okay. Wow. So it was like thirty three times, and you just never heard back. Yeah, actually, do you know what? No, three times. The first one was a telephone interview, which was this first stage. Okay. But I didn't Make pass it. that. Okay. The second one, I finally got into the building um, and had a face to face one, but I didn't get it. And then the year after, um, I, I got the job. Wow. But an important thing um, that helped me with getting the job was finding a mentor. Okay. Um, so I think in general, having mentors are so important when it comes to um, trying to get to where you want to go to. Where you want to be, 100%. Yeah, so um, I found a mentor that worked at the place that I wanted to, to work at, essentially. Um, and I would meet him at the places also is really good to kind of see the vicinities and through having that mentor kind of coached me on things that I should kind of be looking to do to help develop myself and also getting me a day to shadow one of the teams in that building as well so I feel like that was the thing that really helped having a mentor because me building my network in there people kind of knew of me already um so yeah so that was how I finally got into into that role, yeah. Bro, bro we got to, we got to dial this back. Yeah, no. this is sick. So for anybody who's looking to to um, get their dream job, yeah, find a mentor, but not just find a mentor. Find a mentor at the company that you wanna you wanna yeah, work at. Yeah, find the company or the sector. So okay. if it's marketing, and you know a specific type of um, place that you wanna kind of um, work at, maybe look at their competitors as well. So it just opens your horizon of who you can get in contact with that does the specific role. I hear that. And in terms of actually making that connection, yeah. was it LinkedIn? Like, well, how was the outreach to actually start, spark that relationship? Yeah, so um, it was LinkedIn, basically. Okay. Yeah, 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 so it was LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn, I would just say is like, I know we all like love Instagram, TikTok, over, but LinkedIn is the best social app. Yeah. It's the best social it's app, yeah? Best, it's the best <laughs> social app, seriously. Um, yeah, so it was LinkedIn. Okay. That I reached out and you by. just reached out saying, hey, look, I'm keen to, you know, get involved in the sector. Yeah. Would you be open to like a tea or yeah. coffee? Is yeah. that how it went? Yeah, so I basically reached out. I basically said, I've already done this exam, this exam. Um, I want to get into this part of the bank. And I think that was really important because he knew what role that I kind of wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And he was doing that role. Uh -huh. And he saw that I already taken proactive steps to get to that level. Yeah. Um, so I think that was really important in him, like replying back to me and actually wanting to um, take me on his win, essentially. Okay, and my <laughs> my final question before we move yeah. on, how many times you messaged him? 33 times? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. It was once. Just it was once saying. like he, he replied after... <laughs> A week because it was on annual leave. Okay, um, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, that was yeah, that was really good. But yeah, so. do you know what? I think as you say that, you miss a hundred percent of the chances you don't take. Because yeah, oh, even it. me, when I'm thinking about um, getting guests for the show, yeah, like there's only so many people I know, so I've had to start doing cold outreach, yeah. and it's tough. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll go on to my talent management, but yeah, the cold <laughs> outreach in, oh yeah, I could, um, I could, I could definitely attest to that. That is definitely the toughest part of that role, but we will get to yeah, that. Yeah, we'll get there. Anyway, we'll get there. but um, yeah, exactly that. You just don't, yeah, you just don't know what, you don't know what you don't try to do. Exactly. Um, so it's like, why don't you put the ball in your court and just try, you know? So, 100%. Um, I yeah. think a saying that I like to say, to get something you've never had, you've got to do something you've never done. Yeah, so yeah. you really just got to take yourself out of your comfort zone to yeah. um, achieve the things that you want. Yeah. Um, just whilst we're talking about um, the private banking at this time, you yeah. mentioned doing some exams. Yeah. Just for the listener, for anybody yeah. who might potentially want to do the private banking, yeah. do you know what the course was of called? Of course, yeah. So I wanted to be um, a wealth manager okay. at the time. So a wealth manager, essentially, they um, work with their portfolio of clients to provide um, advice. So they provide advice on their investments, their estate planning, their retirement planning. Um, the exam that I did was called the Investment Advice Diploma. Okay. And it was three different exams, essentially, that I had to do. Um, there's different um, exam bodies that kind of provide that same um, qualification, mm -hmm. um, but it was Investment Advice Diploma. That's the exams that I took, essentially. Um, and then, I suppose, a question, and you know, just share as much as you feel comfortable from being in the branch network to yeah. becoming like a wealth manager, mm. 
in terms of um, the compensation package, yeah. is there a significant difference? 100%. 100%, yeah, yeah, yeah. there is. I feel it, ma- okay, it doesn't match the clients that you kind of go with, <laughs> yeah. but it's definitely um, a different kind of salary as opposed to working in the branch network. And I actually didn't become a wealth manager. Um, so I was an assistant. So I assisted the wealth manager. Okay. That was my first role within private banking. My second role was... Um, working with the wealth managers to provide advice. So I told you that we provide that um, a wealth manager would provide advice on different aspects, so investments or retirement. So they would work with what you call a wealth analyst, which I was, okay. um, and we would kind of look at our product suite and see which kind of products would best suit the client's needs and goals. Understood. Um, and then my most recent role now is a business development manager. Okay. So it's internal business development where we work within um, our bank basically to um, find clients that will better be served within the the private banking um, arm that I'm in now. That's sick. (laughs) What what comes to my mind is, is it hard to find, um, I suppose, new revenue streams and find clients because they all got loads of money, yeah? So surely they're they're after what you're giving them or no? Do you know what? I think an important part is what, is the client's needs and goals. Everyone has different types of needs and goals. It could be um, wanting to have enough money um, so when they die that their children can be financially fine. It could be that they're looking to buy a house, they want to invest in in companies or they want to grow their wealth. So there's, although there's only so much you can do with money, there's different nuances um, that clients basically may need essentially. Okay, and You've mentioned the fact that you've obviously taken on a few roles since you've been um, in this new company. Mm. Um, in terms of like your education and um, any other qualifications, yeah. have you got a focus to maybe take further qualifications? Is there anything else in mind? Um, I would say no. Okay. Only b- reason why I'm saying is the role I'm in now is not regulated. So the reason why I took okay, so the reason why I took those um, kind of qualifications was that me wanting to be a wealth manager, the role is regulated. Okay. So you, so the FCA basically... Financial that wealth, Conduct Authority. Yeah, Financial yeah. Conduct Authority, <laughs> exactly. You have to pass these exams to be qualified to be able to give advice because it's very sensitive, isn't it? Advising on money and finances. Um, so, that is, so now, no, I wouldn't need any kind of qualifications okay. going forward, essentially, yeah. All right, interesting. Fun fact, before we move on. My first role outside of uni was in banking as well. Metro. Yeah, exactly. I left the banking life behind and now I'm in tech and you yeah. know, trying to do the podcasting, but we'll yeah. see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> um, but okay, that was private banking. Um, let's move into the talent management yeah, stuff, bro. Yeah, so yeah. for anybody um, who's listening to this, how would you um, define um, a talent manager? For me, a talent manager essentially helps manage um, the careers of the talent that yeah. they manage, <laughs> essentially. But I think it's, one, helping that talent achieve their goals. So helping them along the way of whatever kind of goals that they have set out for themselves. Um, also thinking of innovative and different ways that they can grow their audience as well. And also looking at ways that maybe the talent aren't looking at, mm-hmm. for example, um, I think that's one of the main things um, that are helpful to be kind of a talent manager. And in terms of the talent that you're managing at the moment, um, where is it specifically? Is it like content creation? Is yeah. it, you know, actors? What is it? Yeah, so the talent, so my talent agency, Escalator Management, we um, manage content creators. Okay. Um, and due to the nature of the clients we have, all of them are based at sports. Oh, is it? Yeah. There I was thinking I was about to secure myself a little talent manager, but damn, okay, so sports. Yeah, so sports, yeah. So the content creators um, that I look after, um, their content derives from mainly football. Oh, okay, sick. So even though you're not a professional footballer, you managed to find your way back. It's funny because I have, and it's like due to some of the talent that I've worked with, I've been able to meet like professional footballers, um, which which is which is so cool. Do you know what I mean? Um, and see the other side of off the field activities that they do do as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And in terms of um, you know the agency, yeah. Um, how many? I suppose, clients would you have at any one time? 
Um, so at this moment of time, I manage four. Okay. So I manage four talent, but different agencies can have different amounts of talents. Um, but yeah, my agency, I want to say it's a boutique okay. agency. I've still got the full time job as well. So there's only so much I can do yeah. um, as one person. Um, but yeah, so I've got four. How do you room. how do you actually juggle that at this moment in time? Ooh, yeah. So look, it's early mornings and late nights. Okay. And weekends are a write off. Oh really? But do you know what is? I don't feel like I'm working because mm-hmm. I just find it so fun mm-hmm. um, and exciting. And look, yeah, look, you've got to have a work life balance, and I do manage it. I do manage it well, um, but yeah, it's like working before work, working after work as well. So it's um, it's challenging, but at the same time, it's really rewarding. I hear that. And um, in terms of what you're doing for your talent, mm. is it, um, I know you mentioned, you know, looking at things that they might not be looking yeah. at. Are you sourcing like their opportunities as well? Yeah. Um, yeah. Talk me through like a typical day and week. Yeah. So um, I would say the main part of, um, my role as a talent manager is helping to one source opportunities for my talent, um, but also opportunities that do come in anyway. Is helping navigate that mm-hmm. and dealing with the admin stuff. Mm-hmm. I feel like a talent manager's um, main thing is making sure that their talent can focus on doing what they do good, which is creating the content, content for in in as a as a, if we're, if we're talking about influencers, which is my field, um, it's it's them focusing on creating content creating new ideas to help um, increase their audience, um, increase the quality of their of their videos, essentially. Um, so yeah, so um, helping them with brand partnerships, helping them with their PR, mm-hmm. so getting them to, to go to different events, so different people that are may, may not be in that same industry, but different industries know who they are because mm-hmm. other opportunities can, can be in there. Um, looking at other ways that they can help monetize themselves. So I think an important thing for me is making sure that the talent doesn't long-term rely on the platform because look, YouTube, TikTok, they could, their companies, they could just go, they mm-hmm. could just stop paying ad revenue and stuff like that. So he's thinking, all right, what else can I do to um, grow my revenue but outside? So for example, one of the talent um, that I manage, SV2, who's my little brother, he's got a football camp that he does. I saw separate. in Dubai. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deep. So he just done, yeah. So he just um, finished um, the first camp in Dubai. We've done about, so it started in 2021. We've done about eight camps so far across the UK. Okay. Yeah, so London, Manchester, Birmingham. But the first one we'd done overseas was in Dubai in October, which was really good. But again, that's separate from YouTube. That's in real life and that's a separate business for him. So that's really good. He also has as well a merch merch line as well. Okay. So that's another stream of income. Okay. Um, so yeah, so he's really looking at other ways that they can kind of diversify. That's um, it. Um, so many questions on this. So first thing, if we think about the um, football camps, was yeah. that your idea? No, it wasn't my okay. idea. Yeah, yeah, no, it wasn't my idea. Um, so it was it was actually his idea. Okay. So my brother, so I only started managing my brother last year. Okay. Um, but um, it was something that him and his um, friend that helped him set up the, the merch stuff basically um, set out to do, essentially. Okay. And then as the manager, they have the idea... But, you know, you mentioned the fact that you do the admin and stuff. Did you go about finding the location, making sure there was distribution so people understood about um, about it happening, happening. Um, yeah. and yeah, getting out there? Yeah, so working with, um, so, my, so for the camp, my, um, my brother has an operations manager, basically, okay. that does the operations um, with okay, the camp. So, so working with them okay. to find different venues. So for example, we done the um, camp at Precision Football yeah. in Dubai and they've actually got a really good audience themselves so it was working with a venue that we could have like a mutual benefit with regards to filming content at their studio but also they're having a good social media platform um, as well. That's sick and um, in terms of the merch yeah. are you heavily involved with the operations um, with regards to getting that produced and shipped and stuff as well? So again, so the operations manager for my brother deals with the merch okay. stuff as well. But you're so the liaison. I, yeah, between. exactly. I can be a liaison. But I feel like for me, so where I've come in a bit later into, into my brother's career is more helping him with the brand partnerships okay. side making him look at other avenues. So for example, he's heavily, his content's heavily like football based. Yep. All right, you've got other interests apart from football. How can we show the world like you do that? So 
he loves gaming. Mm-hmm. That's actually how he first got into YouTube. Is it? He like, yeah, he like, yeah. So Call of Duty is how he first actually got into into YouTube. Um, another example could be he likes he likes F1 uh-huh. in COVID drive to survive. I feel like everyone kind of got caught into F1. So it's all right. How can we do some F1 content? How can we partner with with F1 brands yeah, as yeah, well? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Um, I think a good example of someone that's started kind of as with the ages of my other brother that does basketball content. Okay. So his name's called JB23. Okay. And from him, it's starting from the ground up, basically. So I think with him planning his strategy, all right, what type of content creator do you want to be? Yeah. All right, so how does that look like? Um, he likes commenting on basketball games. So what he does every weekend, he'll look at all of the different basketball games, oh, but he'll make short form content on TikTok and Instagram reels essentially commenting on the games. Mm -hmm. Another thing that he does as well, he does funny comedy skits in relation to basketball as well. So that's another way of him diversifying Mm -hmm. the content that he does. Then as well, he also, we we done a a basketball tournament as well last month, which he posted on his YouTube channel, um, which was really good as well. And that's another way of him kind of diversifying um, the content that he does. So you got, you got one brother who does football. Yeah. You got one brother who does basketball. Yeah. Have you got any more siblings? Someone to get into F one? Bro, you're gonna be you're gonna be worldwide. Yeah, just no, going to I, all I, the I don't. Do you know what's so funny? Like my uh, my family is pretty entrepreneurial because my sister does um, off topic, but my sister um, has got her own hair business. So I feel like oh. everyone's got kind of like their, their own, own little thing. like side business um, or, or stuff that they do, which is um, really interesting. Yeah, and you know, just you know, whilst we talk about the fact that you're obviously managing um, family members, yeah. What is that relationship like? Is it like plain sailing? You know, brothers can fight at the best of times. Yeah. So how is that relationship, especially with them being your little, your younger siblings as well? Yeah. Do you know what? That's so interesting. I feel like because I'm the oldest, Mm -hmm. it's probably would be easier than if they were older than me. Yeah. Because growing up, I've always been the one to tell them what to do, not to do. Do you know what I mean? In the house and stuff like that. So I feel like it is easy in that aspect, but it still can be tough as well because because you want the best for them because I'm related to them. You do get more passionate with some of the decisions they maybe make and and stuff. So it is it can be difficult in that in that aspect as well. And obviously, if they wanted to do something, but you feel like, look, this is not the best thing, but they still do it. It's kind of like managing that. But I feel like any talent manager will go through that because not everything that you suggest to a talent they're going to want to do or maybe see the benefit that it could have mm-hmm. um, on them as well. That's true. But I think, you know, coming back to what you said there, the fact that you're their brother, yeah. Um, I think when you're advising them, you genuinely have their best interest, best interest. at heart yeah. versus um, some potential bad actors who could have an angle whenever yeah. um, they're advising them. What qualities do you look for when um, you're considering taking on new talent? Yeah, um, I think... Um, someone that has a clear vision of where they want to go. It doesn't have to be crystal clear, but a good vision because I feel like a talent manager is only as good as, can only be as good as the talent with regards to how they can help them. Mm-hmm. Um, so if a talent doesn't really know what they want to do, yes, it's our job to kind of help maybe navigate that, but someone that knows what they want to do, it's better to kind of help plan and create a structure um, to help achieve that goal and also proactivity mm-hmm. I think proactivity and hunger from the talent is really important because look the way they grow their audience is through consistency and the amount of content is that, that the key thing out. yeah I think consistency so so when I look at my brother JB23 so he started his TikTok and Instagram I want to say literally this time last year okay. fresh so zero followers it's been a year now on his Instagram, he's nearly hitting 2,000 followers, wow. which is good for Instagram because the way the algorithm is these days, it's not as easy to wow, just 100%. get your followers followers up. Um, and then on his TikTok, he's got five, he's just hit 5,000 wow. this week. But he's, if you look at how much content he's posted over that time, he's been consistent posting content week by week by week by week. So the compounding effect of that and being consistent is really important because as well, as a viewer, if you've got your favorite person, you kind of want to have regular updates of what they're going. So if you've got someone that's just posting content 
for a couple of months, then you just don't see them for a while. Someone else might catch your attention and then when they come back, you're like, ah, nah. Yeah. So do you know what I mean? So yeah, that's 100%. where the consistency um, element comes. So I think, yeah, proactivity, so important and hunger to actually want to do what they want to do, yeah. This is really interesting because I feel like even though I've had the podcast um, for a decent period of time, I still feel like mine is brand new. Yeah. So as I'm hearing this, I'm trying to, you know, so consume some of this content for my, uh, consume some of this information for myself. Um, with regards to like brand sponsorships and that, <laughs> obviously um, you've got one brother who's very well known, you know, yeah. he's got the football camps, etc., etc. For your other brother who um, is still finding his feet in the game quite new, yeah. how do you go about sourcing opportunities or is it just a case that he needs to grow his audience at this moment in time? Yeah, so he needs to grow his audience at this amount of time because essentially when it comes to brand partnership, the brand gets in contact with um, with a content creator because they want to utilise their audience to either bring brand awareness um, or bring kind of sales through their business essentially. So it is really important. But in saying that, what I've been doing with my brother is getting him to events in the industry that he's in. So we've been to quite a few events this year, like um, basketball related events, mm -hmm. NBA 2 k events. And it's good because it allows him to network with industry peers and people that are at good levels in what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. um, and also kind of going to these events, meeting the brands as well, just to actually know that he's there. Because I think another part as well is people knowing that you're actually there and them actually them seeing his trajectory mm. kind of rise with regards to his following and the content that he creates as well. So for him, the strategy is more create the content, network, and then eventually those kind of partnerships um, will come as well. Um, how do you get him to those events? <laughs> do you know what? Uh, good thing and the easy thing is me coming with him okay because we go out together anyway like socially so i always try and go to these events with him so it's not just him all right you just go to the events and whatever and it's good because i can also i'm his talent manager so i can also network um when he's at these events while he's at the events creating the content i can be the one kind of networking um so yeah i'll be following him to and, quite and, a few of these and events, yeah. like for anybody who's potentially looking to um get into like talent managing yeah right um i suppose what would your what would your key considerations or advice be for them yeah that's a great question um so if i was to delve the clock back i would first of all look at talent agencies okay only reason why i say that is because I've been in the role, I've been doing this for about a year now and I've had to learn everything for off the bat. So I've used podcasts as a big help for me, LinkedIn as well, because you can see someone's role in a specific agency, then you can see like a competitor, you can see the different roles that people work in, um, as well researching on the internet as well, understanding what a talent manager um, does. But I would say the most important thing, if you was to want to get into a talent manager is maybe look at joining a talent agency because okay. they will give you the kind of breadth and, 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 and skills. With and and so, so work for somebody, yeah. get your knowledge up, yeah. and then if you want to go out on your own, go out. D this is the thing. If you look at my story, a another way is you, you may have a friend. You may have a friend, you may have a family member that is a content creator or some of, of influence you can you could just be like, look, let me help you. If you feel like you can do it, you, you can just kind of reach out to them, ask them if they need kind of help with anything that they're doing and stuff like that. So you can do it off the bat as well, like I did as well. Um, but if I was to dial back to talent manager, the only reason why I'm saying that is because I'll probably learn a lot more faster because that's the day-to-day -day job yeah, yeah, and yeah. all the infrastructures kind of put in place around that. Um, switching gears a little bit, do you find any similarities between the jobs of um, what you're doing in the private banking in the day to day 100%. and um, the talent yeah. managing? Um, banking and the banking I'm in is relationships. Okay. It's, it's, it's customer service, it's servicing. And essentially as a talent manager, I'm one servicing my talent, making sure that their day is um, easier so mm -hmm. that they can focus on their content. The same way in banking as well, you're serving clients, making sure that their finances um, are okay. The relationship part of it as well, building a relationship with your talent to kind of help them achieve their goals and plans. 
Same with banking. You're working with your clients to help them achieve their financial mm. goals and plans. So the similarities with regards to banking and talent management, there's so many different um, similarities. Again, networking as well. As a banker, you want to network to get more clients in. It's the same with talent management. You want to network to get more clients, uh, more brands looking at your talent as well. So although I've not gone through the traditional route of becoming a talent manager, it's kind of my banking has really helped essentially with that. that as well. Do you, oh, I'm about to put you on the spot here. You Ooh, don't have to answer God, this. God. <laughs> um, do you envisage a future where you have so much talent the banking takes a, a back seat? Do you have like a goal in mind to, to transition or do you think you'll always be um, doing the two? Yeah, no, great question. And it's something that I think about all the time. Um, do your work know about your, your Yeah, they work? do. Yeah, yeah. So look, my work's super, super cool. Like everyone knows about it because my LinkedIn, you'll see, <laughs> you see all this talent manager stuff that I'm doing on there. But yeah, no, everyone at like, my work kind of knows what I do. Um, potentially, you never know. Um, at this moment of time, I could juggle the two. It may be that, yeah, it gets too busy that I might have to say bye-bye to banking and go full on. I haven't made that decision yet. Mm-hmm. It could be a, it could be something that might happen in the future. Mm-hmm. Or it could be that I just continue to keep my agency small to the fact that I can still kind of do my day-to-day job as well. I hear that. Um, when we spoke earlier, you spoke about um, personal relationships being yeah. key in both yeah. banking yeah. Um, and the talent management. How do you go about building um, and nurturing the relationships yeah. with, um, yeah, all the different stakeholders you deal with? Of course. One, so for example, okay, so when I started my talent agency, um, I knew that I needed to build up my network in the industry. So my brother um, is good friends with um, a guy called Joel Bayer. Um, oh, yeah, so yeah. Joel Bay, he um, he's got he's a content creator in his own right. He's got his own platform called Cheeky Sports. He does um, a podcast with Rio Ferdinand uh, as yeah, well. That's vibe, crazy. vibe with five. Um, so my brother and him used to play for a YouTube team back in the day. Essentially, oh, is it? yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I started my talent agency, I reached out to him and I was like, "Look, I've started my agency. If there's any sort of like events that you can invite me to or whatever, just to build up my network, that would be great." And he was so kind and so forthcoming in helping me with that. So I went to last year, even this year as well, I went to quite a lot of events and he introduced me, introduced what I do. Um, oh. And it's funny, one of the events, the first event that he took me to, he introduced me to someone um, at that event. And I ended up working with that person, with a campaign, with my brother later on um, down the line. Wow. So that's why the relationships is is really important. and. Yeah, I think um, networking is just the most important thing via LinkedIn and via events. I would say this actually, I found it so daunting in the beginning going to events. Mm -hmm. I'm a very chatty person. I'm a very sociable person, but I knew that I had to get out of my comfort zone and go to events on my own because you can't always have someone coming to your events. And mm-hmm. it's funny because I'd go to the events and the first thing that I'd do is go to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go to the toilet and be like, all right, cool. All right, all right. Because some, it's awkward going to an event on your own and not knowing anyone. Mm-hmm. And you see people talking in the group and you're thinking, oh, oh I don't want to disturb them. Mm-hmm. Um, oh man, uh, what am I saying? Like, I've, I've not done, I've not had this agency for a while. Are they going to think I'm undereducated in it? Do you know, so imposter syndrome, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But, by going to events constantly, I've helped to grow my confidence in just networking and, and it's been really helpful. Do you have any techniques when you're at an event on your own yeah. to go into a group of people to start conversations now? Yeah, it's literally, don't think and just go. <laughs> literally, like it, it, it's as simple as that. Like I think as humans, sometimes we overthink stuff that are just not important. Mm-hmm. Like. The worst that someone could do if you go up to them and is like, sorry, I'm just busy at the moment. And cool, you just go to the next person. But no one's ever done that to me, do you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, literally, if you're at an event, just go and speak to someone, do you know what I mean? Um, and so important. When you're um, deciding on the events that you go to, yeah. is there like a framework you're using? Um, and what? obviously you're going to these events to network. Mm. How do you decide that, okay, this is an event I need to be Yeah, at? so that's where LinkedIn comes in. Okay. And I think it's following people that are in the industry that you're in because mm-hmm. a lot of people promote events 
on LinkedIn. Okay. And when I look at the majority of events, it's either through knowing someone that I've connected with in the industry and saying, oh, look, there's this event you want to come to, or seeing someone post it um, on LinkedIn. Are these, are these events typically free or do you need to have some funds behind you to pay to attend these events? No, nah, so the majority of the events are free. Um, there's some events that you have to pay for, mm-hmm. um, but the majority of them are free. So it's really good because you're going free to go have drinks, talk with people, but business could be done um, yeah. at the back of that as well. Um, have you had any um, difficult experiences trying to network or outreach and how have you rebounded from them if so? Yeah, um, I would say outreach um, for talent is probably one of the most difficult parts of the role because you have to understand you're reaching out to a brand or company and maybe at that time they don't have the budget for what you want or what their goals are for the brand don't align with what your talent um, can, can, can achieve and afford. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's probably the most difficult part. But look, just like with my 33 applications <laughs> um, in, in, in banking, it's just keeping keep on going. Um, and actually when I think about the maybe like brand partnerships that I've done with some of my talent, m- the majority of them have been through knowing people. Really? Yeah, the majority have been through being known people as opposed to reaching out via an email or LinkedIn. Um, so that's why I make sure I'm always trying to go to as many events as possible. Be active. Be active, create meaningful um, um, so, uh, meaningful relationships with people. And I think another important thing as well with the networking thing is not even just networking for yourself, but networking with other people, networking for other people. Mm-hmm. So what I say by that is, Let's say I go to a networking event and I meet someone, a brand, but they deal with journalist type content creators. I know that none of my content creators are journalists, but where I've built a network of other talent managers or people in that, I'll say, oh, do you know what? I actually know someone that may be beneficial for you. And by making those connections with other people, one, it's a good thing to do anyway, because mm-hmm. you're potentially providing an opportunity for someone else, but also people will remember that and you never know what could happen in the future mm-hmm. um, or where people may be in their careers in the future. So that's something as well that I'm always not thinking about what I can do for my own talent, but people in my web network that I know and that I can help as well. Sam, I hear it, bro. And you know, if there's content creators who are looking to get a nine to five job, and they need to learn about what their best friends do. I think I know where you're going to be pointing <laughs> them in future. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm joking. I'm joking. No, this is sick. Um, how do you collaborate with other professionals in the industry? So you've kind of just touched upon it, but like, yeah, with agents, with publicists, yeah, um, to yeah, support your clients. Yeah, career. so no, that's a great question. So the first thing is all yeah is opportunities that I'm that may not be right for me is giving it to them another thing is collaborating with the talent that they manage yeah. as well so that's another important thing because for example um there's a few um concepts I have that um have a relationship with footballers yeah. so all right how can I get my talent for example my brother to create content with that football like, whether that be with a brand or just on his own social channel as well um so I'd say yeah that's one of the ways that I um kind of um, um, one of the ways that I communicate with people in my industry and also inviting those people to events that you go to as well mm-hmm. because as well you never know who they can meet that could be beneficial um, for them as well so you, you, you mentioned inviting people to events there it's funny because in my um, in my job in tech yeah. we have events and um, like even like this week I've been sending out emails for like Christmas Christmas yeah. link ups but our marketing team will be like there's limited capacity. You can only bring two people. Yeah. Like, do you have to deal with that as well? Or the event you're going to, it's uncapped and anyone can... Anyone yeah, can so it. most of the events I go to are uncapped. Okay. But for the ones that are not, if I go to the event and I know what the event's about, I would look around my network and see, all right, who out of my friends or, or like peers would have most benefit okay. of coming to this event, essentially. So that's normally how I work when it comes to inviting like my peers um, to events and I think as well um, communicating with industry peers because you're in the same industry there may be scenarios that they face that you may face in the future that you're not aware of but they can shed light to you Mm. so that can better equip you so an important thing I would say is one that I've learned from a talent manager for is getting a lawyer yeah getting a lawyer 
I didn't think of it at the at the time, but having a lawyer this year has been so helpful because why? Because look, you have to understand as a content creator, mostly with the brand stuff. Um, there's so many te technicalities with regards to um, content creators. Their... Not even pitches, is the content creators owning their IP okay. and their likeness because it's so valuable. Them owning their likeness and their IP is so valuable. So you get some crazy contracts where content creators are signing as well. That's another value add as well. It's like the legal stuff with regards to content creators. So you might have a company that say um, they'll put in a contract we have exclusive irrevocable rights in perpetuity, meaning that essentially the content that the, con that the content creator has created, they can essentially own that and do whatever they want. So, wow. and, and, if, and if a content creator signs that, they could be walking Leicester Square, see their content on there, but they ain't been paid for that. They've only been paid for the one little Instagram story post that yeah. they've um, posted on it. So the lawyer in that aspect has been super helpful with understanding those technicalities with regards to um, brand project and as well then working with other people that are in the same industry as you them shedding light on 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 different things that people have gone through as well so mm -hmm. that's been super important having a lawyer yeah with regards to the talent how important because i've actually recently had another content creator on so it's, okay. it's really good to like compare and contrast what yeah. you say how important are collaborations with other content creators i think they are super important. Okay. Great example, the Sidemen. All of them guys in the beginning, they were all their own individual creators, but through collaborating and um, playing video games with each other online or whatever, they formed their little friendships. And then look, now they've created this incredible um, media house um, that they've got now. So I think collaborating is so important. And again, when you collaborate with someone different, you're open yourself up to a completely different audience as well. Do you, Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and with um, the people that you manage, are yeah. you trying to get them to collaborate or are you looking to um, external people potentially with like completely different audiences? 100%. So when I even look at the F1 parts as well, speaking to different um, um, brands or teams within there and then getting my content creators to create content within that realm opens them up to F1 fans that would have never maybe seen their content because they're not really interested in football or basketball. Um, so, yeah. That's that's sick. Um, in terms of measuring success mm. um, of, of, yeah, content, yeah. What, what are the main KPIs? Is it just views? Um, what are the key things you're tracking across, across your client base? Yeah, so, all right. So, if we look at campaigns, it's normally how they've worked. And if that's helped to achieve the brand's goals. Oh. Yeah. So, for example, the brand had a specific amount of impressions or views that they wanted to help achieve their metrics internally. The content creator hitting those metrics, that's good in it because one, you've helped provide good quality um, for the brand, but as well, building relationship. If um, a content creator does really well with the content that they create for a brand, they'd want to come back. Mm -hmm. And create more content, which mm -hmm. is great financially mm -hmm. um, for the for the um, for the content creator and their opportunities um, as well. What was the question again? <laughs> I don't even know the question. I just asked. I just asked it off the top of my head. Um, I've, I was basically saying, what are the key metrics? Um, oh yeah, yeah. That you're using to, oh yeah, keep it. Okay. And then another thing as well. Look, essentially, the content creator them building a deeper relationship with their audience and increasing their audience as well because. The bigger their audience is, the more kind of influence they have on certain stuff. So, for example, if they wanted to create their own separate business, them having a bigger audience will positively help the success mm -hmm. um, um, of that as well. And again, achieving their goals as well. What is it that they actually want to achieve in the long term and kind of hitting those different milestones as well. Super important as a way of like measuring if you've done something really good um, for, for content creator. I hear that. Um, when I think about footballers, actors, content creators, I assume that you're going to come across some people who are difficult to deal with. Um, <laughs> have you had any experiences dealing with particularly difficult people? And if so, how have you um, navigated these situations? Not really. It's more brand stuff, and I don't want to put that up. Yeah, that's <laughs> tough. That's tough. That's tough. Um, are there 
any innovative approaches or strategies you've employed in talent management um, that you find particularly effective? Yeah, I would use um, my brother JB23 as an example. So at first he wanted to just do podcasting, funny enough. Um, and I said, that's all well and good, but let's look at a wider scope of how you could reach a, a basketball audience. And that's where he started to move into doing short form content creation mm -hmm. on basketball games. Um, but I think one of the one of the things that I wanted him to get into where short form content is really like increasing in its popularity with like the likes of TikTok and Instagram reels was more getting him to do comedy type story skits with basketball. Um, and we had such good success with that. So we've got one comedy skit that he did where essentially he um, basically reenacted the fact that when he was young, he could play so much or whatever. But now at this old age that we're at now, when he just does like a, a jump shot or whatever, he's back certain basically. Yeah. Simple, really simple concept. But that, um, that, that video got about 10 million views. <laughs> Yep, and 100,000 likes. Bearing in mind, at the time, he only had about 500, 400 followers on Instagram. Wow. Yeah, so looking at a different way, or basically diversifying the type of content that he made was really good approach. Um, so that helped to boost a lot of the followers that he's got now as well. In terms of making those videos, yeah. who, like, how do you conceptualise that and make that happen? Like... Have you always known how to use a camera? Has he always known how to use a camera? Yeah, it's funny enough, in this day and age, yeah, you don't really need much skills <laughs> to create content. And I'm, yeah, he used his iPhone, literally okay. iPhone and a tripod. So there wasn't anything crazy like this setup that we've got here in the in the studio with all like lights. I'm wasting my money. But like, yeah, so it was literally a camera and an iPhone. The ideation part, I think it's looking at what's worked well in short form anyway okay. and a lot of skits about stuff from the past mm. to now mm. those are really good concepts yeah um so it was literally using one of those concepts but in a basketball form that really helped um okay. with content yeah i hear that in terms of uh talent management yeah what is the most stressful thing about the job reading contracts <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not it's not stressful per se actually do you know what i think the most the, the most stressful thing in talent manager, I think it's the fact that there's so many different moving parts. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as well as that might be stressful, it is fun as well because no one day's the same. So there's so many different things. It might be booking a shoot for um, for talent. It might be um, arranging them to go to an event. It might be dealing with a brand partnership. There's so many different moving parts, thinking about other ways of helping to monetize um, or grow their audience. So there's so many different parts, but I would say the fact that there's so many different moving parts can get kind of a bit stressful. Okay. Um, you almost answered my follow-up question, oh, but I'm still going to ask it now. What would you say is the most rewarding part yeah. of being a talent manager? The rewarding part of being a talent manager is seeing your um, talent grow. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Hit Them hitting milestones, I think is so important. So um, my brother SV2 he hit 3 million YouTube subscribers last year that's crazy yeah 3 million and that was such a big moment because he started doing YouTube I say with a consistency feat 12 years ago so when he was about 13 he's 24 now wow so you can imagine all those years of work but he's got to where he's got to now um, so yeah I would say seeing them hit milestones with regards to their following because that is one of the most important things mm -hmm. um, for them as well another thing as well actually is being with them like in public and seeing their fans um, or their viewers come up to them and ask for a picture it's yeah. so heartwarming because it's like wow like someone like really like puts this person um, in, in a high in high standards basically mm -hmm. um, I want to um, obviously take pictures with them and just like to get fascinated like the camps is just for my brother and for SV2 the camps like going to those just like wow all these people traveling from all over the world coming to just play football but mm -hmm. brother do you know what I mean um, so those are the rewarding parts yeah and you know just on that the, your brother has the camps yeah. when I think about like football content creators there's a lot mm -hmm. how do you 
ensure that your brother like stays on top of the game and doesn't just become another one of them football content creators? Yeah, I think what you see with all of the biggest content creators that they're always innovating the content that they do, they're always doing stuff that is outside of the box. Mm -hmm. So my brother is working with him to think, all right, what can we do that no one else is doing? or is a different variation of what other people think because what you're saying is important. There's just so many content creators, there's so many saturations in the market. So how can you differentiate yourself mm -hmm. from that? Um, so I think, yeah, the most important part is finding outside of the box ways of of producing content um, and ideas. Sick, 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 sick. Um, switching gears, yeah. you obviously now work with other talent managers. Yeah. What would you say is a common skill amongst all of the best talent managers that, you know, for yourself and the people that you work with? Yeah, um, I think I would say is relationship building. Mm -hmm. And that's two sides. That's relationship building with the content creator. Because essentially, as a talent manager, they are literally trusting you with with most of their, their stuff, you know? So building that relationship um, with your content creators to make sure that they trust you in the decisions that you make for them, the opportunities that you put forward to them, um, and then again, relationship building externally. So helping to bring opportunities because as a content creator, the main ways you're um, earning an income is through like your brand partnerships um, and stuff like that. So again, building relationship externally as well is mm -hmm. really important. And um, in terms of like that relationship building, yeah. How is it that you've become so good? Is it something that like you were naturally, you know, something that you were born with? Have you like read any particular books, you know, followed anyone specifically to learn? Um, I think it's a mixture of all of those. I think one as well, I'll go back to banking. Being in banking is a relationship game. And I've been in banking for what, eight years? Mm -hmm. And I've worked in different parts of the banking um the banking sphere and I've worked with different types of people so I feel like that's helped as well understanding how to deal with different people again I think integrity is so important as well so do, do it um making a decision that I would do for myself mm. do you know what I mean I think it's super um super important as well reading as well is mm -hmm. so good um when it comes to relationship understanding human psychology is so important Agreed. because there's so many different types of people, yeah. personalities, um, some books that I can recommend, Surrounded by Idiots, that's okay. a really good book. Yeah. Um, Human Nature by Robin Greene as well. And those kind of talk about different personality types and whatever, and it's good because it helps you to understand how to navigate with different types of people because there's no one size fits all way of approaching different people. Mm -hmm. Again, as well, even that for the talent, how is it that they work? Sometimes they don't like when you tell them, oh, you should do this. There's another different way that you can articulate that in a way that it's not, um, it won't make them kind of put their guard up mm -hmm. with regards to it. So that's something that you, you can learn basically. So yeah, so books as well has been super important as well. Six, six, six. Um, you mentioned the fact that obviously you're still working two jobs at the moment. Yeah. Do you have any productivity hacks? Productivity hacks, oh yeah. So I'm a real like spreadsheet Nerd. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So for me, time is so valuable. And me personally, if I don't plan out my days or weeks, I feel like the task at hand could just kind of go longer than it is. So ugh, this is so geeky. But every Sunday, I've got like a spreadsheet essentially. Yeah. And that spreadsheet has got different quadrants. Yeah. So let's say, so I've got religion in there, mm -hmm. I've got um, health in there. I've got my business, I've got personal development and they're all color coded. Mm -hmm. And on a Sunday, I would look at the week and essentially with those different, um, with those different, um, uh, with the different colors or the different yeah, with, topics. Yeah, with the different topics, I'll plan my week ahead of that. So let's say personal development, I'll make sure that I'm reading a book on Monday for a specific amount of the hours or whatever. And then at least I know at the end of the week, I can look back and be like, all right, I've done this, that, that. All right, what haven't I done that's been enough of what I wanted to achieve, for example, or specific hours of reading or specific hours of working on the business. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that, I, that's, a, that's a hack because you knowing what you're doing with your time can help to one, have deep focus with the task at hand, mm -hmm. um, but also 
plan on what areas that you want to kind of increase essentially i hear that six 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 um a couple of we're coming we're coming to the end and we're going to do a quick fire round um a few questions i want to ask before um we wrap up one is you hear about managers a lot would you be able to share how a talent manager makes money so obviously we've spoken yeah. about like um brand deals for um the talent how much can a manager expect to earn as like a commission off of the deals and whatever's yeah. like working with the talent? Yeah, no, great question. So um, I would say the main source of income from a talent manager is the commission mm -hmm. and it's commission on normally brand partnerships. Okay. Um, industry standard is 20%. Oh, wow. Yeah, 20%. Yeah, that's normally the industry standards. Obviously, different managers charge different amounts in it, but essentially, normally it's 20%. There's some managers don't agree with this, but actually, you know what? I don't even want to say that. No, no, say it, say it, no, say no, it. Okay, no, there's some managers that maybe take a percentage of like a YouTube creator's ad revenue. Is it? For me personally, I don't yeah. agree with that because yeah. it's like the talents um, kind of built up their platform on YouTube. But look, that's just my, that's just my view. But yeah, um, brand partnerships is basically the, the main and, thing and, as and well. And taking a percentage of that. So no, no like base salary or anything like that earning comms from the, the deals that you go and source for your talent. But that's, as a talent manager, setting up your own business. Mm. If you work in a talent agency, you do get a base salary. That's so true. I know you get a base salary um, and I know you get a specific percentage. So it might be 1% of the 20% that the actual talent management company makes off a deal. Okay, um, I know that that's another way of, um, of, of making income um, okay. as a talent manager. Another way is, there's some talent managers that have set up businesses with their creators as well. So it's that long-term piece, isn't it? Of, mm. of having some commission on the joint business ventures um, that they've made. So there's... I'm thinking, I'm thinking Chris Jenner. Oh, oh. Right, she's, she, she's like the pinnacle, right? She set, up, she set up businesses with each of her kids. It's so funny you say that because um, recently my wife's been watching Keeping Up With The Kardashians. Yeah. And but when she started watching I was just like oh yeah all of this yeah but do you know what yeah because she's watching seasons that have been like um, that are more recent or whatever oh my days it's actually so interesting like mm. I rate I rate them because their business happiness is actually off the charts and it, right? I'm not gonna lie it's so funny um, one of my friends called me um Chris Jenner, because obviously I'm like managing my yeah. brothers. <laughs> You're Christopher, Christopher yeah, Jenner. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, but no, yeah, no, they, like literally, um, yeah, they, um, yeah, no, they're good actually. Um, the last thing before um, we wrap up here. So last two questions. One, if we go back to the private banking, um, you've obviously had a few promotions. Yeah. To people who feel like stuck yeah. in their current role. Okay what would your advice be to them to, you know, secure progressions in their career? Yeah. Okay, so there's two things. So if it's about you not necessarily enjoying, I think the first thing is look at what something you want enjoy. Yeah, something that you enjoy. Because there's only so much, if you don't like a job, then there's only so much you can kind of progress within that role if you don't really have the heart. Um, but let's say you wanted to progress in role. It's one, finding out what is needed to become the next level and start doing it from now essentially mm -hmm. a good example is like i said when i was in branch banking i started doing exams that normally people within private banking will be doing so that helped mm -hmm. to one um help my knowledge and experience um in the topics at hand um, but also helped to show proactivity from the hiring manager um as well um so i think that yeah those are probably yeah. the most important thing is looking at the job that you want to get into um but also working basically doing it as in the role that you're currently in yeah, moment, I hear that. essentially wonderful yeah. answer um where does sam see himself in the next five and ten years great question it would be great to um see the agency at a place where the talent on the roster um have really grown mm -hmm. um from where they're at the moment whether that being their following being um bigger like much bigger than it is at the moment or them creating um big business businesses uh Big businesses, Big businesses yeah. um, in the future as well. Um, yeah. So, Do you see yourself creating any content? Um, nah, I'm the behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, yeah. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the behind the scenes type of guy. So 
Yeah. Nah. Okay. Head. That's sick, Sam. This has been so sick. We're we're, we're not done yet. Yeah, um. Man. Thank you so much for this, bro. This yeah. has been really insightful. Um. Before we go, you ready for a little quick fire round? Let's go. Um. Work from home or work from the office? Oh, work from home. Money or happiness? Happiness. I said that without hesitation. I like that. Um. Favorite day of the week? Friday. <laughs> <laughs> um. Time in a group or time alone? Do you know what? I know it's quick fire, but um, before COVID, I would have said time with a group, but after COVID, I've learned to like enjoy my own company. I like that. So I'm going to say time alone. But when I say alone, that's including my wife. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, he gave a wink, he gave a wink <laughs> to the camera. Um, would you rather travel to the past or future? I'll travel to the future. Nice. Um, favorite book? Psychology of Money. Uh, deep. The- and he was just on Stephen Bartlett recently. Yeah, he was. Know, yeah, I watched that yeah, last week. Yeah. Um, night out or night in? Night out, man. <laughs> Party, <wet> heart. <laughs> um, who has it easier, men or women? Wow. Um, men. Good. 100%. Yeah. Um, name a book you think everyone should read. Psychology of Money. Fair. Yeah. Um, and are you listening to any good podcasts at the moment? Yeah, I listen to Earn Your Leisure. So there's two American guys. Um, they talk about they mostly talk about business, financial literacy. Um, I've been listening to them for years. And they're probably, when I think about the most um, podcasts that I've listened to, is definitely those two. That's yeah. Nice, nice. Um, Sammy, we do have a closing tradition on okay. this podcast. And um, it's basically a question. Okay. So knowing everything that you know now and with all the jobs that you've done, yeah. what advice would you give your 16-year-old self? And would you still be doing the same thing? I wouldn't be doing the same thing. Wow. Yeah. If I would have said, if I was to look back at myself um, at 16, I would have done everything that I did. But after uni, I would have said, keep trying to apply for those kind of marketing roles, actually. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And not to say that I don't like banking. I love it. I find it enjoyable. But I feel like where I am now, I could have been at that place much earlier if I maybe stayed in that. Wrong, because I always think about, oh man, I know all this stuff now. Oh, if I knew it about seven years ago, yeah, doing better, so I would have said, I would say that actually. Wow, you might actually be like the first person to I say, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd say, um, I'd Sam, bro, this has been um, a really insightful conversation into both private banking um, and talent management. Uh, thanks for coming on, bro. How did you find that? Hey, no, it's been really good. It's my first podcast, but yeah, no, it's really good, man. Hopefully, the first of many. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> well, guys, um. Actually, before I say that, where can people find you? Um, on LinkedIn, Sammy Balligan. Yeah, 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 so find me on LinkedIn. We'll put that in the notes. And guys, as I always say, if you've made it to this part of the episode, make sure you like, subscribe, share, comment. You know, I want to be doing that. I want to be hitting <laughs> milestones too. You know, it's not just his clients. <laughs> I want to hit some milestones too. So help me, please. Um, and with that, guys, this has been another episode of What My Best Friend Does. If you didn't know, now you know. Over and out.